question. Uh, Josh Barrow is um, uh, a uh, uh, hospitalist and palliative care physician at Cook County Hospital. Um, he's a clinician educator with research interests in medical education and ethics at the end of life. And Josh will be speaking on organ donation among undocumented Hispanic immigrants, assessment of knowledge and attitudes. Thanks. So I'm standing between all of you and the party. Is that where we're at? <laughs> Great. Uh, it's a um, good spot to be. So um, I'm Josh Baru. Um, I'm excited to be back at U of C. I uh, did my residency here, and I went on to do the McLean Fellowship. Um, thank you for inviting me, Mark. Um, so um, I've been at Cook County since uh, finishing my residency. And uh, today I'm going to be discussing a study that we performed at our hospital. I want to give a special thank you to Dan Bronner for um, advice and insight, Brian Lucas for methods support, and Carmen Martinez, who is the saintly nurse who interviewed all these patients on her own time. So I have no financial conflicts of interest. I do have organs um, and may at some point desperately need one in the future. So th that may be a conflict. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So. Um, my interest in this issue, actually, it started with a case. Um, Maria, uh, this is not actually her, um, but she was a 33-year-old uh, undocumented uh, Mexican woman uh, who was admitted to our hospital with shortness of breath. Um, she was diagnosed with acute myocarditis, and she rapidly deteriorated to the point where she was um, requiring maximal life support uh, to survive. Her family um, was told that the only option to save her life was a heart transplant. And she was evaluated, um, however, she was deemed not to be a candidate because she was, quote unquote, undocumented. Uh, she was ultimately actually uh, de declared brain dead. Um, so um, she was approached by representatives from our organ procurement organization, which is the Gift of Hope in Chicago. Uh, when the hospital interpreter translated the representative's request, her family turned to the interpreter uh, and looking at that person said, how could you ask us for this? Um, you know that she couldn't get one. And this issue has actually been getting press recently. Um, this summer, in fact, undocumented immigrants and advocates uh, protested outside of major medical centers in Chicago. And as you can see from, from the signs um, and from the headlines, they were protesting the fact that undocumented immigrants cannot receive organ donations. Now, I want to take you know, a couple steps back and just explain what we're seeing, right? So, I mean, excluding patients from organ transplantation because of their immigration status seems, doesn't seem right. And in fact, the Organ Procurement Transplant Network has a policy that directly addresses this issue. And it clearly states that a person's citizenship or residency shall not affect allocation of organs. But you know, the reality isn't so clear. Uh, the majority of undocumented immigrants are effectively barred from receiving solid organ transplants because of restrictive reimbursement criteria. Right, so upwards of 60% of undocumented immigrants um, in the US work in low income fields that don't provide um, private health insurance. Um, at the same time, federal law expressly excludes them from any fer federally funded program, right? Medicare, Medicaid, this also applies to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so as a result, this group is effectively uninsurable. Um, and as this group is uninsurable to receive a transplant, they would need to cover the costs of the procedure and follow-up care independently. Um, of course, solid organ transplantation is expensive. Um, and as a result, organ transplantation in this group is exceedingly rare. How relevant is this question? Well, based on current estimates uh, by the Pew Hispanic Research Center, it affects approximately 7.2 million people. Okay, so. This explains why our patient couldn't receive a heart transplant. And now, now I want you to focus on the second piece of the story, right? Because though they aren't eligible to receive organs, these uninsurable, undocumented people can donate organs. And in fact, CMS and JCO reg regulations require that we ask them, or at least I should say, ask their families um, for their organs, right? The so-called required request rule. I find that difficult to say. 
Okay, right, so what this means is that people are being asked to donate their organs into a pool from which they are expressly excluded, right? And this challenge is a fundamental principle of the organ transplant system, fairness. Right, so that's the background. That's how I got to these questions, right? I mean, do un undocumented immigrants know about this? Um, how do they feel about it? Uh, would knowing this change their opinion about donating their organs? And, I mean, should we be explaining this to people before asking them to donate their organs? So, to determine the answers to these questions, we performed a study. Um, we used a convenient sample of patients um, admitted to the General Medicine Service, um, and we interviewed them on their first hospital day. Uh, we enrolled 59 patients. Um, uh, we approached about 133. So we included all patients who were over 18 years old, who spoke either English or Spanish, and who self-identified as undocumented immigrants or legal residents who had their green cards for less than five years. And just to be clear, in Illinois, legal residents who have had their green cards for more than five years are, in fact, el eligible for Medicaid. So um, we excluded patients who self-reported having diseases that would preclude them from being organ donors, namely cancers, HIV, chronic viral hepatitis, and the reasoning being that if you knew that you couldn't really donate an organ anyway, your thoughts about donating, uh, donating your organs, or at least your responses to our questions, might be different. So our participants were predominantly Mexican. Um, all but one were Spanish-speaking. 93% uh, were uninsured. Uh, they had low educational achievement, so 87% um, had high school education or less. Um, they had strong support systems, so 87% had family in the U.S. and 87% had children. And interestingly, 63% had family members that were U.S. citizens, which might uh, suggest some degree of acculturation within U.S. society. Okay, so what did we do? All right, so the interview consisted of 32 questions, uh, took about 10 minutes to complete, um, and it was performed at the bedside in a face-to-face -face fashion. Um, there were three parts to the interview. There was an assessment of knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about organ donation. We then performed an intervention, and then finally we collected various demographic in information. So uh, the intervention, I, this is what I wanna focus on um, for, the, for the remainder of the talk. Um, so here's what we did. Uh, so we asked people if they had health insurance. Uh, we then told each participant that people without health insurance can go only get an organ transplant if they pay for it th themselves. And we asked them if they knew this. We then asked them to guess, in dollars, the cost of heart transplant, liver transplant, and a kidney transplant. We then gave them the actual costs of the procedure and then reassessed uh, whether they would be willing to donate their organs when they died. Of note, uh, we had asked this same question about willingness to donate um, earlier in the interview at the, at the very beginning. Um, so we were able to document whether there was a change or not. So regarding the cost estimates, um, so most of our participants, 68%, uh, knew that they would have to pay for an organ themselves. But they dramatically underestimated the cost of the organ transplantation. I mean, look at the median estimated costs by our participants, right? And then compare those to the actual costs. I mean, they're off by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, even people in the 75th percentile aren't really close. And just so you're aware, these costs um, were, they incorporate 30 days of kind of pre-transplant workup, um, the procedure and attendant hospitalization, and then 100 days of, 100, excuse me, 180 days of post-transplant outpatient care and medication. Uh, and then inside we, the box, we see people that change their minds. So you'll see that 43 people, that far right column, stated that they would be willing to donate their organs before the intervention. Three changed their minds after the intervention. 16 people uh, who had stated that they would not be willing to donate their organs before the intervention actually changed their minds after the intervention so they would donate their organs. So, I mean, you probably don't need statistical tests to tell you this, but we performed the McNamara's test, which assesses for a change uh, within a group after an intervention, and the p-value at the bottom of the slide there is 0.48, clearly not significant. So now, to be frank, our study has limitations, right? The sample size is small, the possibility of social desirability bias is clearly present. Um, 
The reported willingness, as previous speakers have said, does not correlate well with behaviors, but you know, we believe that it really that it is provocative. Um, I mean, the present situation in which a group of people can donate resources to a pool but do not have access to the benefits of that communal pool is inherently unfair. Now, that said, the solution to this is a political one, right? And um, one piece of this puzzle has been addressed in a fashion, and let's see how that plays out, I hope, it, um, you know, but through healthcare reform. And we can be hopeful, if not optimistic, um, that the second piece may be addressed in the near future with discussions around immigration reform, okay? But our study raises a corollary issue in this situation, which is access to information, right? And there are real significant barriers to organ transplantation with this, within this community. And the participants in our study lacked key information about these barriers. I mean, it's inter information that is relevant, and it's information that they want. And this is a problem with a much more straightforward solution, a solution that I believe is within our purview as uh, clinicians and advocates. Much of the discussion around organ, organ donation centers appropriately around scarcity and increasing access. Um, however, you know, a robust organ donation program requires that in pursuit of our goals of saving and improving lives, we demonstrate respect for persons. As Dr. Sanders, I think, is, all, is exploring. And respect for persons requires fairness and it requires informed consent. And our study suggests that for the undocumented immigrant community, these foundational principles are not being met. Thanks. And I found Dr. Saunders' uh, discussion or in use of you know, uh, the word coercion, um, I found that interesting. It's, you know, the number that is where you, have, you feel like you, it's such a, you know, such a great deal that you need to do it. I'm not 100% sure. I, I don't know. I, I find that interesting. But I, and I, this question of asking an undocumented immigrant for their, say, for their kidney, would they feel coerced? Um, part of that depends on how the question is asked, right? So, I, and what type of information the person is given, how the question is asked. So, sometimes you'll hear these concepts of going three deep, asking three different ways, the question three different ways. Um, I don't know that for that, you know, the case that I spoke about, asking that family three different ways whether they really didn't want to donate the organ, to me seems putative. It seems uh, there's something wrong there, right? And so I don't know that it's coercion, um, but it's certainly, um, I don't think it's appropriate, um, would be kind of the, 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 the weakest um, word I would use. Well, please, please join me in thanking Josh and, and all the speakers for this session.